What do you think of when you think of Bon Jovi? Arena rock, huge perms, New Jersey. Well, you should also think killer bass lines. That's right, we're digging into Living on a Prayer from Bon Jovi's 1986 Slippery When Wet album. I'm gonna show you not one, not two, but three things that make this bass line awesome and how you can apply them to your own playing. The bass player on this track is either Alec John Such or Hugh McDonald. It's a little controversial, but either way, it rocks. And if you want to follow along, I transcribed the full song in sheet music and tab for you. Just check the link in the description. Also in the description is a link to Rick Beato's channel. His What Makes This Song Great videos inspired me to make this video. So go check Rick's channel out, subscribe to him, you'll learn a ton of cool music stuff. The first thing anyone would notice about the Living on a Prayer bass line is that iconic riff that gets doubled by the guitar. Part of what makes this riff cool is the use of pedal point. Pedal point is where a low note, or a group of low notes, gets repeated while other instruments, in this case the keyboards, play a series of different chords over the top. So the keyboards are changing from the E minor chord to a C major chord, to a D major chord, and then back to E minor. But the bass keeps playing an E minor the whole time, which creates some tension that gets resolved right here when the other instruments land back on the E minor chord. Here's what the song might sound like if the bass did not use pedal point by staying on E minor when the chord changes happen, and instead followed the chord changes. If you want to try out pedal point for your own bass lines, all you have to do is not change when the other instruments change chords. It might feel a little tense, possibly very tense, depending on what the chord changes are, but when everyone comes back around, it can feel really good. Here's a quick demo. Let's be real, a lot of rock bass lines are not that interesting. It doesn't mean they're not right for the song, but it's exciting when you hear tasty melodic bass runs in an anthemic rocker like this. And a bass run is just another word for a bass fill. It's some cool transition notes that you add to your bass line. Like in this spot, going from the first verse into the pre-chorus, the song goes from an E minor chord to a C major chord. And a less interesting bass part here might be to just go straight from E like this or to just stay on the riff until the section changes like this that would be okay but not as engaging or dramatic as a bass run which in this case melodically connects the E to the C with a run up the E minor scale using the first second third and fifth notes of the scale to C which is the sixth note of the scale, which creates some forward momentum into the next section. Hear that is in context. If any of this stuff about scales or chord progressions is confusing, I cover it in way more detail in my Beginner to Badass course at BassBuzz.com. Here in the fourth bar of the pre-chorus, there's another great bass run. It's one of my favorite little melodic moments in this song. It sounds like this. Rather than just going straight from D to E, which is what the guitar chords do, this little run mimics the vocal rhythm when he sings make it or not. Here's what the bass and vocals sound like together. The biggest awesomest run in this line is in the chorus, connecting the D, G, and C chords played by the rest of the band, and it sounds like this. Yeah, that's right, one run connects three chords. This is a cool example of what musicians call playing over the bar line. The bar lines are these lines in the sheet music that divide the music into consistent groups of beats. In the case of this song, four beats each. So rather than ending the run on the G chord on beat one, which might sound like this, or playing D straight through that whole bar and then starting the run on the G like this, It's all one big run. One, four, one, one. 
Since most fills or runs end right on beat one, playing over the bar line can add a lot of flair to the structure of your bass lines. The trick to playing over the bar line without sounding like you're lost or just excessively noodling is to pick your target notes where your run should start and end. In this bass run, playing over the bar line works because its final target copies the accent on the and of two from the vocals, keys, and guitar. So if you wanted to come up with your own over the bar line bass run for this section, first you pick your targets. You need to hit D on that first beat one, then G on the next beat one, and then C on the and of two, because those are where the chords change. Then the rest is basically fair game, as long as you nail those. Here are a couple examples. I'll just use notes from the E minor slash G major scale like the original run does. Keep all the same target notes, just fill in the blanks with some other scale notes. Here's another example, same target notes. I have a step-by-step -step beginner lesson here on YouTube if you wanna learn more about how to come up with your own bass runs, AKA bass fills. And remember, there's sheet music and tab for the full song in the description if you wanna follow along. And please click like on this video if you wanna see more of these bass line breakdowns. But that only gets you halfway there. Please also subscribe and click the bell to get notified so you don't miss the next awesome bass line. If you analyze enough great bass lines, you'll notice something most of them have in common. They do a good job of following the song's intensity. What does that mean? Most songs following a standard pop structure start off less intense and then get more intense. And you can hear that pretty obviously in Living on a Prayer. Here's the intro. And here's the outro. Huge difference, obviously. So part of what makes this bass line work is it follows that intensity in terms of busyness, like how many bass runs and fills there are and how crazy they get. You can really see this structure by comparing the first chorus to the last chorus. In the first chorus, the first few bars are definitely melodic. but they're fairly scripted and mostly keep the eighth notes chugging along. We only get this one fill at the end of the phrase that actually disrupts the rhythm a little with that 16th note hiccup. Compare that to these four bars from the last chorus when the song has changed key up to G minor. There's a nice variation with a slide at the end of bar one, and then the run up the scale in bar two gets extended. And bar four is full of these cool 16th notes. So if you're coming up with a bass line, start by listening to the song in terms of intensity, and then decide how much space should you fill up at the beginning versus the end, or in a verse versus a chorus. A good rule of thumb is to just save all of your runs and fills and fast notes for the more intense parts of the song. But don't go overboard on your intensity variations, or you might sound like this. Time! 